And I'm really, really happy to introduce you to Nikki. Uh, Nikki Zimmerman, she's an associate professor of system dynamics at the University of College London. Thank you so much for accepting this challenge, Nikki. I'm really happy to have you here. And yeah, you can take over. That's all from my, from my side. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Fernando and Rebecca. Great. So I hope you're seeing my slides now. Uh, a very warm welcome uh, from myself to this uh, seminar. It's really great to have so many people here. Uh, many thanks to the System Dynamics Society who helped organize this, and also many thanks to the people from Benson who made this possible and who are also here to help along answer a lot of questions. So today we want to focus on Romeo and Juliet, and I really want to build hands-on the first model with you. So it's not just a seminar to listen to, it's also a seminar to get active and, and do some modeling, and on this way introduce you to the System Dynamics modeling uh, process. and uh, what you can expect from today is, as I said, that you will build your first quantitative system dynamics model. So we heard from you that a lot of you are new or completely new to system dynamics. So this is just right, the, uh, good, a good thing um, to build uh, your first model. You also learn how you apply Vensim software to very, very basic um, quantitative modeling questions really um, to start with. But if you have other software, of course, you can also do the seminar with that software as well. It is just that I will rather explain things in Vensim. Um, and the system dynamics modeling process will also be a big focus. And I hope that by doing this, you understand why I am excited about system dynamics and also excited about this model that we are looking on today. And where does this all come from? So um, like a couple of weeks or months ago, I was asked like, if you do a two minute um, presentation or video about a snippet in system dynamics, what would you do? And I said, I would do it about the Romeo and Juliet model. Uh, and we noticed that two minutes is really not enough. So we made this two hour seminar um, out of it, uh, but it is not only kind of based on my ideas. Actually, the idea comes from Mike Rodziki. He wrote a paper on a teaching case using the model. And also it was um, brought to me by John Warcroft who I heard talking about it in a seminar. I think it was uh, the UK system dynamics um, chapter conference where he talked about this teaching case and how he had adapted it. And they were both exciting, uh, excited about the idea to present it here. And uh, so many thanks to them as well. And as I said, I want to talk a lot about the process of doing system dynamics. And I divided it into the process of systems thinking and simulation. Here you see it in a very kind of linear way, but of course it is not so linear. But it should always kind of be based on a good problem definition. So we all know that people like to jump into solutions and conclusions, uh, but we really need to define your, uh, our problem. Uh, because um, although it's called system dynamics, it is really the modeling of a problem and not of a system. So you can do this by yourself and you can also do this kind of in a shared way, kind of with lots of stakeholders, uh, but having some kind of problem definition is a very, very important starting point. And then we usually ask, what are the key variables that would present this problem? And just kind of one, two, three key variables. And then we look at their behavior over time. And looking at the past behavior, how did these variables behave in, in a relevant amount of past time? And what is our most likely expected, but also desired and maybe feared future behavior of these variables? And once kind of we can kind of define this in behavior over times, then we have basically also defined our goals for the system as smart goals, because kind of in variable terms, they are very specific. Also as behavior over time, they are measurable at each point of time. Um, they are agreed in a term of like often with other stakeholders. Um, they should be relevant, uh, relevant uh, variables and behavior over time to our problem. And uh, they should be time-based. And this also is the case when we map them over time, because then at each point you can compare 
uh, whether you have achieved your goals. And then we often develop what we call a dynamic hypothesis. So this is what we think is the underlying feedback structure that causes our problem, our issue. And we do this in feedback diagrams or causal loop diagrams. Of course, a lot of projects end here and there's a kind of a lot of uh, value in qualitative system dynamics modeling. But today, kind of we also take into consideration the quantitative aspects of modeling. So often we then go on and develop stock and flow diagrams. Stocks are the accumulations in the system. So for example, if you think of a swimming pool, the water that is accumulated in the swimming pool, that is a stock. Um, and then the flow would be the water that is flowing in the swimming pool or flowing out of the swimming pool. And it can be of like physical elements, but it can also be kind of social or mental elements, uh, stocks and flow. And then you give these stocks and flow structures equations. You might get your information about the stock and flow structure and about the equations, for example, from existing literature. You might contact experts, ask them. You might have group model building sessions where you build model structure and equations together with a group of other people, uh, depending on what, what, what your um, issue is and the purpose of your modeling. And once you're sufficiently happy with your model, you, you start simulating, so you generate behavior over time. And then the last point would be analysis. And why kind of analysis and implementation is just kind of one step here, it actually involves a lot. Um, kind of you test the structure that you have built and actually this is part of the validation of the model. And this is a process um, that goes all the way through from the very beginning. So, um, you start testing the structure already here, for example, when you develop your key variables and behavior over time and feedback diagrams in terms of kind of how can you back up these structures and all the way through. Um, so validation is something that really kind of um, is happening all the time. And at some point, uh, you might be sufficiently happy with your model that you think kind of it's sufficiently good. And then you might use it to simulate and you compare the real and the simulated behavior. Maybe then you want to do some more corrections to your model because you identified some gaps and this helps you get more understanding because you dig deeper. And then uh, you would identify and test policy alternatives. So you move from a stage of kind of testing kind of the model to then testing policies, looking at different future scenarios and then um, as a last and important step, implementation of the changes that you identified would be beneficial in the model to include this in the real system. So that's an overview of the system dynamics um, modeling process, of course, in reality, not as linear as it's portrayed here. But that's also what the plan is actually for our uh, seminar today. So, we actually want to model those two on the right here. We want to model Romeo and Juliet in love. Um, and have you ever thought about your romantic relationships in terms of feedback mechanisms? Not yet. <laughs> That's what we want to do. So we want to look at whether system dynamics modeling can help us understand the waxing and waning of love between Romeo and Juliet. So that is our problem definition, the vexing and waning of love between Romeo and Juliet. And those of you who are not native speakers, the vexing and waning of love, that means basically the ups and downs of love, right? And going up and down between phases of enthusiasm for the other person and maybe uh, not so enthusiastic about the other person. So we will build a system dynamics model of Romeo and Juliet's love together of their vexing and waning love. And um, before we do this, I just want to go a little bit into the literature. So this is not just kind of an example. Actually, there are people doing research about a love dynamics and the modeling of love. Here you see a couple of examples and they have like 
nice names like love dynamics, the case of linear couples, etc. Um, and there is some nice work from John Warcroft who used this to distinguish di different types of modeling. So on the one hand, you have these high fidelity models. They try to be as close and analog to the real world as possible and as realistic as possible. Uh, for example, you have them in the system dynamics world where you have models with thousands of variables and they might be used um, like project management models that might be used in court cases, um, in litigation. Um, and you have kind of the majority of, of models kind of are rather illustrative. So they have like a medium number of variables of a couple of dozens or a couple of hundreds. They are the most typical ones in system dynamics. And then you have the metaphorical models. They're usually small and or even tiny models uh, like ours today. And um, they provide a lot of insight. So they are not as kind of realistic and detailed as the other ones, they, but they have important and interesting dynamics and patterns of struct and patterns of behavior. And they're really good for learning about the system. So that's what we are going to do. Um, let's build and analyze uh, the Romeo and Juliet model together. And let's go through the process together. So first, as I said, we start the system um, dynamics process with a problem definition. And we already have our problem definition with the vexing and veining of love between Romeo and Juliet. So that's for today what we are going to take as a problem definition. And then um, the next one would be the key variables. And here I'm actually asking you. So if you go to um, callf.com and you type in the code SDS equals 877, there is now the possibility that you can type what you think your key variable is for this model. Um, I see that availability to see each other is the most popular one. Time, length of relationship, amount of love, time spent together, number of meetings, love, family, happiness, money, attraction, enthusiasm, number of conflicts, level of love, geographic proximity. There's a lot of suggested variables, Nikki. That's fantastic. So I'm gonna, so there is the love and there's the amount of love. I mean, let's, that looks like an important one. There was also something about time. Um, yeah, that's the second most popular. Yeah, yeah. So yes, uh, let's start with, let's start with those, I think, and yes. Then there's Romeo, somebody says Romeo's love. Yeah, so there are lots that say love or um, love for each other, Romeo's love. Yeah. Then lots of kind of family relation and time spent together. That's, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of family related love. It's <laughs> also entered many times. Um, hatred between families chemistry level, environmental circumstances, emotions, trust. <laughs> Take it off the balcony. <laughs> um, respect, time, feelings. There is a lot of variables. There's a big one here. Love, emotion, stress, infidelity, time, number of meetings, money. There's a lot. Conflict, age. There's no poison here, no. You would be a great <laughs> group for group model building. I think this would be a wonderful model here. Could we go up to the ones that are very highly voted? Uh, this is the most fun. Okay, so yes. Ability, ability to see each other, yes, and, and the time, yeah. Um, a lot of you kind of vote for like the time spent together and availability to see each other. That's great. I also kind of saw a lot of kind of love between them or love in general. And I would say kind of to keep it simple, let's focus on those simple things first to represent their love. Um, so 
if I'm going to um, go to a whiteboard now. You can take over the share screen, um, Mickey. Right. So let's start very simple with their love. So kind of those Romeo's or Juliet and also there's Juliet's love for Romeo. So we start with this very simple things, not going into the height of the balcony or the families, et cetera, and, and the friends. We just start uh, focused on them. And uh, with the idea that Juliet's love for Romeo is influenced by how much Romeo loves her. And also that Romeo's love for Juliet is somehow influenced by how much he perceives that she is loving him. So in a sense, a lot of you said kind of that the time they spend together is very important. Kind of this is kind of indirectly captured in the sense that, I mean, they do spend time uh, together or at least they perceive how much the other person is, is loving them. And uh, we also kind of said, so we have a, a number of, of uh, variables kind of here. I picked two um, to just represent the very core idea um, of their love for each other between all the many, many things that you um, suggested. And kind of one step in the process is also that we map their behavior over time. So if we have, um, Their love here and time over there. Kind of, we want to represent the vexing and veining of love. So kind of these ups and downs of love. So this would kind of, yeah, it would just go up and down in some way, right? So we would expect some behavior that is going uh, up and down. We would expect this for Romeo and also for Juliet and maybe kind of that they are not really in, in sync. So rather than having like a stable or an ever growing rough relationship, it is this up and down. And also, as one uh, element is kind of how does Juliet react to Romeo? So uh, we think that Juliet would love Romeo the more she perceives that he loves him. So this means kind of there's the same directed relationship and we indicate this by a plus. So kind of this means it's same directed and minus would be inversely directed. It doesn't mean that Juliet's love grows. It just means it goes the same direction as Romeo. So when Romeo increases his love, Juliet increases um, her love as well. But when Romeo is not loving her, um, then she doesn't love him back either. And we also know from kind of the ups and downs kind of that there must be something in the structure kind of that is not kind of always, um, always kind of that it creates this uh, reinforcing love. So there must be something that also goes the other direction. So we are conceptualizing a runaway Romeo. So while Juliet is increasing her love, the more that Romeo loves her, Romeo is a bit the opposite. So Romeo finds Juliet really interesting when she is far away. But when she gets too close, she starts running away. So actually he has an inverse relationship um, to Juliet's love. The more she loves him, the less he loves her. And that's kind of our dynamic hypothesis for what creates these ups and downs in the relationship. And here we have created um, a balancing feedback loop. A balancing feedback loop means that it's a feedback loop where you change the direction. So let's assume if both were pluses, like if one increases the love, then the other one would increase it even further and then even further. So that's 
reinforcing um, um, feedback loop. And it goes kind of when you're triggered with a change, it just continues um, and enforces this change more and more. Whereas here, when you have a kind of an inverse relationship at some point in your feedback loop, um, it takes things back. So kind of when here love is increased, then some of that is also inverse. So that's a balancing feedback loop. And we don't know this by a B and we can draw also a circle around it to indicate that it's a balancing feedback loop. So here we have gone from the problem definition to with the variables, the behavior over time and the feedback um, structure. And now it's actually time to go into actual modeling. And I hope you have your Vensim already open. I am switching over to Vensim and you should see my screen. Um, so this is the new Vensim version of um, version nine. And um, you see a couple of kind of, in the first line, you see a very typical file edit, what you see in most programs. In the second row, when you, oh, you can open a new document, save the document, and then the actual modeling tools start. And if you do not see the modeling tools, then you might need to go to new, create a new model. Um, and also I recommend that you save the model. So for example, you can go to file and then save as, and you save the model. I saved it as the Romeo and Juliet model. Pick a name that you want. And then you can save your model. And uh, you can also, of course, you can model Romeo and Juliet. You can also kind of model uh, Romeo and Tom or Juliet and Ginny, whatever you like. Um, I go with very classically with uh, Romeo and Juliet. And now we want to start modeling what we just did on the whiteboard, which we will also share with you. So you will get um, the whiteboard screen uh, later. Uh, we will start doing this in Benson. And we start with what is a stock. So I already mentioned that the stocks are the accumulations in the system, like for example, the, um, the um, water in a swimming pool, right? And where water in the swimming pool accumulates, here also we have, uh, for example, the love of Romeo and the love of Juliet, they also accumulate. So what we just had in the causal diagram, they are going to become our stocks, our accumulations in the model. And we map this by these, this stock tool. So here you see the stock tool. I hope you see my mouse. It's the one that has the S inside. And we click on the stock tool and then you can click uh, where you want to have um, this stock tool in the model. So let's say pretty much at the top, we click and a text field comes up and you type a Romeo's love for Juliet. So just join me in this. So I said, this is hands-on. So, um, you are all able to follow with your own model, and um, so that built it, we built it together. Right. Um, maybe the font is a bit too small for you to see, so you can keep the font as you like. I change mine, so I right click somewhere in the screen, and here I can change the defaults. So I go from Times New Roman 12, I might go to another font, and I say size. 20. Okay, so that's bigger now, hopefully more readable. Romeo's love for Juliet. And then let's put Juliet's love for Romeo here as well. Let's put it in the bottom left corner. So if you still have this stock tool on here, the stock tool, 
you can just click again into the screen wherever you want to have that variable, right? So you have the stock tool on and then you click where you want to have it and then you just start typing. Juliet's stock for Romeo. And you, you uh, uh, click enter at the end and then the variable appears. And I assume some of you might have done typos. So when you are still in the stock tool, you can click onto the um, variable again, and there you can change um, your typing and correct your typos. So you click, when you're still in the stock tool, you click into the stock to change the name. So now we already have our two important stocks, the variables that we considered in our causal diagram. And now we're going on. So um, when we have stocks, we also need to change the stocks, right? So Romeo and Juliet's love, I mean, we, we mapped it out as kind of the, the waxing and waning, the ups and downs. Um, so something needs to change their love, right? So kind of the stock and love is not constant. It needs to have a rate of change. And every stock in a model is changed by rates of change. So we also give our love of Romeo and the love of Juliet a rate of change. And the rate of change is here um, in the flow tool. So flow or rate, kind of they are synonyms. Um, and it's the one where, where it looks like kind of the, the one like water flowing through a pipe. So this is the flow tool. I hope you see my mouse. And you click on this. And then you click a couple of centimeters to the left of Romeo's love, like at the same, roughly at the same height. So you see where I have my mouse. So I'm in the, in the flow tool, I click here, and then I drag the mouse into like roughly the middle of the stock um, so that it really kind of, it captures the stock and I click again. So I click once on the left, a couple of centimeters to the left of the stock, and then I click well into the stock. And you see now also that a text box appears again. And we said kind of this is the rate of change of Romeo's love. So let's call it change in Romeo's love. And you see that I, I used initial like large capitals for the stock and I keep everything in small letters for the rate. So that's just a convention. I push, I mean, it's, of course, you can do it different, but it's a convention to very quickly recognize what type of variables do we have here. Um, initial capital letters for stock, everything small for rates. And once you finish typing, you click enter again. And then the variable name will appear underneath the flow. I'll give you a little bit of time to do this. I hope you also now see that my mouse is actually highlighted so that you see it better. Um, so here you see the flow of the change of Romeo's love and you see this cloud on the left. So the cloud is the system boundary. It does, it means um, we are not, I mean, we are not concerned about what is behind that system boundary, behind that cloud. It means we are not concerned about where Romeo's love is really coming from, right? We just say it, it, it appears or it might disappear, but we are not looking at where it disappears into. And we now do this um, also for Juliet's love. So make sure that you still have the flow tool activated here. And then I suggest that you click a couple of centimeters to the right of Juliet's love. 
you click once, you drag your mouse into Juliet's love and you click once again. And then you can type change in Juliet's love and you press enter. So I explain it again, you click a little bit, I can do it again. You click a little bit to the right of Juliet's love. Then you click into Juliet's love and you call this change in Juliet's love. Enter. And you see you have we have the same um, structure for both of them, just kind of one time it comes from the left and the other time it comes from the right. And we have the cloud again here. And now we are connecting these. Um, so you see the arrow tool, that's the one, the blue arrow that's a bit bent, which is to the left of the flow tool. So this makes connections that are not uh, flows, connections that do not change stocks, but all the other connections in the model. And we click on this. And we know from our causal loop diagram that we're trying to now model in more detail in a stock and flow way that Romeo's love influenced Juliet's love, right? And we had a direct connection here. But actually, we also said that stocks are just kind of changed by their rates of change. So it's actually that Romeo's love influences the change in Juliet's love here. And here we click also like somewhere in the middle of Romeo's love. And then we can click either onto the text or onto that little tiny arrow that represents this flow. And we have created a blue arrow. So for those who didn't follow, I do this again. So we have the arrow tool activated. We click into Romeo's love and then we click here on to that little arrow, or we can also click into the text. Yeah, it's fine. And if you have done a mistake, if you um, click Control Z, you make a step back. So that's what I always did when I undid something. You can also here use the undo button. And uh -huh. Nikki, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, I see there's some questions that uh, the interface looks a little bit different. Uh, and Mike just posted on the chat that if your interface is different than what you've seen from Nikki's, you can go to tools on the menu in the top bar and click switch to new sketch. So you see exactly yeah. uh, the same version as um, Nikki's seeing right now. So it's again, it's tools, um, the menu at the top bar and click switch to new sketch. Here you see tools and then switch to yours is correct. <laughs> you don't have to switch back to the yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to show it this. Yeah. Uh, Fernando, thanks a lot. Are there any other questions? Because please uh, like type your questions into poll everywhere and then I, I answer them. Uh, as we go through and I show things, um, because I'm sure kind of things uh, don't always work so smoothly. So please ask your questions. And under nothing else at the moment or? Um, we, I think people, we're helping out in the chat, um, uh, Nikki, we do have a few questions in Poe Everywhere. I, I can share my screen if you want to answer a few ones. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just open this. Um, uh, there is one question that just came through on the chat which is why um, Romeo's love for Juliet's arrow does not go to Juliet's love directly, Nikki. Ah, oh, yes, that, that, that's so um, because 
the stocks are always kind of, they always have a rate of change. So a stock is an accumulation. Mathematically, it is an integration. Um, so um, kind of, and a stock is also, I mean, it is not kind of changed directly, but also always with the rate of change. Um, so kind of the rate of change that would be like, it's technically the derivative of the stock. It is change in the stock. And therefore, since it represents the change in the stock, right, everything that influences the change needs to go into the change variable rather into the stock variable itself. Because the rate of change does represent the change and then everything that makes it change, go up and go down, needs to influence that change variable. In causal loop diagrams, um, you do not distinguish between these types of like flows and stocks. Um, so there you can jump over a lot of um, steps and make it, make it a direct link. Uh, but you have these direct links for stocks only for the initial value. So that's something we do in a few minutes, um, but we do not have them um, for the other variables, because that always needs to go through the, um, uh, the rate of change. So um, there, there is a lot of questions not related to the model itself, Nikki. We can maybe stick it to the stick to the ones uh, related yeah. to the modeling now. Um, yeah. I know you guys curious. This is an introduction to system dynamics. So there's a lot of questions related yeah. to that. Um, I have version nine zero and don't see the stock tool. Um, so it was the question about that. We just did the sketch thing. It's just going to the yeah. upper menu on two and switch to yeah. the new sketch version. Yeah. Also, I mean, you can maybe maybe some of you, especially if you have a, an older version than the the recent one, um, you uh, I mean, there is still something kind of when you hover over it, um, still at the roughly at the same place. Uh, there was also there is also the stock tool in the old versions. It might be called level. So if you find something that is called level, it means stock. Um, um, okay, I think other... that's it. Uh, okay. related to the web, the model. That's it, uh, Nikki. Yeah. Okay. Yes. If we have time in the end, we can also answer like lots of other questions. But let's stick to the modeling at the moment. Um, and then go to the other questions uh, later. So let's go back to the model. Okay, I hope this also gave you some time to catch up if you hadn't been able to follow. Um, so uh, we, with this arrow tool, uh, we did this um, link uh, from Romeo to the change in love. And you see that there is this little like bubble in the middle and you can grab it here. So you can grab it with a double click. Um, you see it turns red when I double click and then you can move the line as you want to have it. And we try to make it round as we had it in our in our causal loop diagram, but that's just to, to make it look nicer. Um, and then we also use the same for uh, um, the other way round. So my arrow tool is still clicked. So I click into Juliet's love. So we always click first into where the arrow comes from and then we click into where it goes. So we click into Juliet's love and then into the change of Romeo's love. And so what might happen is maybe you are not like fully there. You might click somewhere in the middle, but then you can still uh, click on. So kind of, you can also like um, click twice on the way and you, you can grab the bubble and you move the variable around. Uh, sorry, move the arrow around. So we have a feedback diagram again. We have Romeo's love influencing Juliet's love. And um, we also said this is the same directed um, relationship. So we've, we presented this with a plus. And if we, um, 
if we go on this move tool here, this is the little hand here on the left. You see where I'm with my mouse on the move tool. So now we are not creating new variables anymore, but we can move things. So we can grab Romeo, for example, and we move things around. And I can also now highlight the link, for example. I can do this by either clicking on the little bubble or I do it by clicking on the head. And then I can, for example, I can right click here and I add the plus. So the polarity of this link would be a plus. I click the plus here and I click OK. So I go back and I do it again. I right click either on the bubble or on the head of the link. I right click. And in this area of popularity, I select the plus. I can also, you also see where it's, it's placed at the arrow head. You could place it at the handle. So the handle is that little ba uh, bubble. Uh, but let's keep it at the arrow head. And rather than putting it outside, I prefer to do it inside, but that's just taste, right? So, um, and this created this plus at inside. Um, the arrow head. And inside always means kind of inside um, where it's bent. And to replicate this for Romeo, we right click here. And we said Romeo had an inverse polarity. So here we click the minus. See, I click the minus. I also say I rather prefer to have it inside. And I click OK. So you click on the error head with the right click, and then you select the polarity and you click OK. That's how you do this. Good. We're not quite done yet because people mentioned uh, something about time, actually. So people said kind of time is important and time will also be important in this model in the sense that they do not adapt their love to what they perceive and love from the other immediately, right? I mean, they just adapt to some proportion and that's what we still need to express in variables. So they do not adapt fully, but partially or like Fractionally. So let's say um, Juliet perceives lo Romeo's love, right? And then, like, when Romeo loves her a lot, she also increases her love, but she doesn't increase it like as much in the first step as he loves her. It's just a proportion. Let's say it's maybe 50%. And then only in the next round, another 50%. And um, that's what we are going to represent. So there's a fractional adaptation. And now we select the variable tool. So this is the one that has the A here. Uh, also kind of, if you use an older and, uh, version of Vensim or a different layout, um, it's the one on the left, it is called variable. We click this and um, I type here. So I type on the top left corner. I use capital letters here and I call it a fractional adaptation. Of Romeo's love. We don't see it anymore. So I use this move tool, like the hand with a finger. And I just move them all a little bit down. So I have a fractional adaptation of Romeo's law. So I clicked on this variable tool here. 
Then I clicked on the top left where I wanted to have the variable. And I, um, I also put my caps on, on the, on the keyboard and I type the variable name. And we do the same with Juliet. So we, I also click um, here at the bottom right and I type fractional adaptation of Juliet's law and enter. And you see, we also created this other variable. So again, we, we use this by this variable tool, the one with an A that creates all types of variables that are not a stock and not a rate. And these types of variables that we just created are two constants. So it is like what percentage they always adapt. And it's like, it's always the same percentage. So we are going to use 50%. And um, it's also a convention um, to type um, constants in capital letters. So it's nothing you are absolutely required to, to do. But if you do it, everybody will see immediately um, this is a constant. And then we also connect the constants um, to the variable. So we use the arrow tool again. We click into the fractional adaptation and then either into the name of the change or into the uh, little arrow here. And it created that connection. And we do the same for uh, um, Juliet's adaptation, um, click in, into the fractional adaptation of Juliet's love, and then we click into the text. Good. Um, Fernando, anybody else? Do we have questions at the moment? Uh, yes, there is one question here that we might want to answer. Um, Nikki. Um, um, I came from an organizational behavior background and I'm interested in using system dynamics for modeling human behavior. Uh, and I care, a carry that I have is, um, are there any standard tests to determine whether a variable is a stock or flow? For instance, how do I decide whether motivation is a stock or a flow? That's an excellent question. Um, yes, so distilling stocks is, and it's not always easy. So uh, if it's something that accumulates over time, I mean, that's usually, that's a stock, right? And uh, like, I mean, water in a swimming pool, love. I can equally, I can see motivation accumulating. So you can have a lot of motivation and, or, it, or it can drain over time. Um, and it might not grow immediately, right? So it might take time, it might depend on other things. So that would speak a lot for it being a stock. Sometimes you can have such motivate such variables being like uh, rather the composition of other things that are stocks, right? So if you have three components that motivation is made of, maybe those three things are the stocks and then motivation is just the, the sum of them or so. So it might sometimes depend on what you are modeling and how you're modeling. So it's never an absolutely easy question, but the thing to ask you, if you think it accumulates over time, um, with some delay is not being changeable immediately, then uh, make it a stop. And then the change is the, the, uh, is the, the rate of change of the stock. Uh, I think motivation would mostly not be a flow because then it, I mean, if motivation is the flow, what would be the integration of motivation? It might rather, um, influence something else. So yeah, I would rather see it as a stock. <laughs> um, I think for model for model related questions, that see, um, uh, how do we distinguish between stock and flows, Romeo's law versus versus change? How do we select them? Uh, yeah, I would I think, think it was pretty much the same yeah. question. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
flows are also we often related kind of they, they represent the decisions uh, or they, they group the decisions in, in the system which then change the stocks right so we might do things to um if it's like the, the water in the swimming pool right i mean the change of water in the swimming pool like that's like our decisions about like putting like more water in or letting water out of the pool that's like our decision and then the stock in the pool that's the result that's like when time stops what is still there what you can then measure so like what what do you have when time stop stops I mean, that's also a good indication for what actually is a stock. I um, also, yeah. I, I think there's a few questions that was in the chat, um, Nikki, and there is one here. So I think people are still a little bit confused on why uh, the my plus or minus in the dynamic hypothesis. Maybe if you can briefly repeat that, I think would yeah. be nice. Yeah. I will stop sharing my screen then. So that is because we wanted to model a runaway Romeo, right? We wanted to set Romeo up a little bit different from Juliet and um, the kind of to, to model a person who is kind of rather running away when somebody gets close and or and then but then finding the other person really interesting when that other person doesn't show any interest. So that was the purpose uh, behind it. Maybe other readings of the play of Romeo and Juliet would kind of get to like other conceptualizations of, of um, how to, uh, yeah, how to model Romeo and Juliet. Um, so this is a choice that, uh, that uh, we made. It's not supposed to be the most realistic one, but that's kind of what we wanted to do, kind of to model these invert, like different individuals. I also saw in the normal chat that there was something um, about a change, whether we can change the uh, um, name of a variable as well. So yes, kind of if you actually if you're in in if you're in the flow tool and you want to change the name of the flow, that's a bit risky because you might just create another flow. So you can always do this when you're in this variable. Um, uh, tool right where you see my mouse now then you can click onto the stock and change the name or you can click into a flow and change the name you can click into a constant and change the name that is all possible so changing the name is easiest when you're in this variable tool or you right click on the variable and you go to equation and at the top you see the name and here you can change the name as well and here, the first line is the name of the variable where you can change on any typos. And then on the top, on the bottom left, you click OK once you have done this. OK, two variables are still missing because um, stocks always need to have initial values. So uh, Romeo's love. Uh, for Juliet, kind of um, when Benson starts calculating, it starts by calculating the rates and the other variables, and then does stocks last. So in order, for example, to calculate the change in Juliet's love, it takes this fractional adaptation and it takes Romeo's love, but then it needs to have some value of Romeo's love. So we always need to have an initial value for all of our stock. Otherwise, kind of when we have like a feedback loop, we would just go always to the ones before, to the one before, and then Benson wouldn't know kind of where to, uh, where to start. So we need initial values for stocks. So we take the variable tool again, and we create a variable that we call like initial Romeo, for example. I'm still in capital letters. And we do this for Juliet as well. This is getting a bit too cramped, so I put everything a little bit up, have a bit more space. 
initial Romeo's law, initial Juliet's law, and we connect them. So this is with initial values. That's the only time when you can collect, uh, connect um, other variables directly into a stock, when it, the only time when it does not go via a rate. So we can take our um, arrow tool again, we click into initial Romeo and then into Romeo's law. And we have created that arrow. We do the same with initial Juliet and then into Juliet's law. And we see them connected. Wonderful. So now our model is actually complete. We have the full structure and we can start putting in the equations. We have an equation editor. Here in this row, you see the f of x. That's our equation tool. So if you click on this, suddenly all your variables that are not defined, they will become black. So you click on this f of x, and then we can start um, putting in the equations. Um, and typically you start with the stocks kind of because they are already predefined. So let's start with the stock of Romeo's love. We kind of, when you have this equation tool on, you then just click into Romeo's love once, and the equation tool comes up. And you see here, the equation is already written as the integral of the change in Romeo's law. By, by using the stock tool and adding the, the flow to it, the rate of change, Bensim already knows that the stock of Romeo's law for Juliet is, um, is um, influenced by the rate of change. And I see that Henry started screen sharing. <laughs> so I'm just, apparently we're seeing Henry's screen at the moment. I'm going to share my screen back. So now you should, should see my <laughs> screen again. Um, so the change in Romeo's love is kind of our rate of change. There is nothing we need to do about this, so this is already kind of complete. We just need to put in the initial value. And we have, you see here in this field, they are the variables that are somehow inputs and can be used as inputs. And this is what we can select from. So what we now do is you click your mouse so that the cursor is in the area for initial value. And then you click once on initial Romeo's law. And then you have the initial Romeo log there. You can also type it, but when you type it, I mean, I make like typos all the time. And then when there is a typo, Vensum doesn't recognize anymore that it's actually the same variable and doesn't know what to do. That's why kind of, if, if you can select a name from somewhere that is already defined, always do this. There's one more thing we need to do is we need to define units. So um, the change in Romeo's love should have units. Of course, when you have water in a swimming pool, it's probably easy because the units would be like cubic meters, for example. With love, it's maybe a bit more difficult, a bit more abstract, but it's always recommended to give it units and we can just call it love points for heart. So yeah, I call it love points. So here in this units area, I type love point or, uh, no point. So let's let's use singular love point, not points. Um, because I mean, since Vensim um yeah doesn't know that point and points is the same, uh, let's just use singular love point. There would be a way to tell Vensim that it is the same, but let's not go into that detail at your very, very first seminar. So let's call the units love point. And then we are done. So we can click on OK here. So again, for those kind of, you are in equation two, you click on the variable. The rate is already defined. You put in the initial value by putting your mouse cursor there and then selecting the initial Romeo love 
um, one and you type love point into the units and then on the bottom left you click OK. Let's now do the same for Juliet's love for Romeo. Um, we are still in the equation tool and we click onto Juliet's love. It's the integral of the change in Juliet's love that's already defined. We do the same with the initial value here. We make sure the cursor is there and then we put initial Juliet's love. We click once on it. And rather than typing the units, um, you remember I said kind of when you can select something from somewhere else, use that in order to not make typos. Here you have these little like arrow and then kind of it opens all the variables, all the, sorry, all the units that are already defined. And you see three units here. You see your love point that you just defined. You also see month because our model is currently running in month. And you see DMNL, that stands for dimensionless. This is also um, defined already uh, kind of by Venson that you, I mean, a uh, unit can also be dimensionless. So we select love point here. We click on it and then it puts the units love point there. So love point um, change in Juliet's love and we click OK. And then we can click on the initial values, initial Romeo's love. So if Romeo's love is measured in love point, then also the initial value is love point. So we can already select the unit love point. And let's start, say kind of when they initially, initially meet, they find each other already quite interesting. So kind of they are half in love. So let's give it the number 0 0.5. So in the equation, we type 0 0.5 and please type 0 0.5. Not, I know in some countries you would, if it's like, if you want to like express that it's 50% or a half, in, in some countries you use 0 0.5. But uh, since Bensim um, is, is uh, an American software, you, it accepts like the 0 0.5. And then we are done here already. So the initial love, it's just a constant. It's just one number. So it's 0 0.5 half. And we click OK on the bottom left. We, and also the initial Juliet's love, we do the same. Um, we select the units, select it from here, love point. And then in the equation error, we type uh, 0 0.5. Of course, you can also use the keypad buttons here. I personally find it easier to type it on my keyboard. So 0 0.5. They both start like kind of uh, with half laugh when they meet each other. and click OK. Good, half of them defined. Let's go over to the fractional adaptation of love. Let's start um, with Romeo. So the fractional adaptation of Romeo's love. So I said, you know, this is um, by Romeo seeing how much Juliet loves him. Um, how much of that he adapts. And let's also choose 50% for the moment, right? So let's also um, use the equation 0 0.5. Let's think about the units. It's the fractional adaptation that Romeo adapts each time. So the time that the model is running in is month. So it's the fractional adaptation each month. So it's fraction each month, fraction per month. So one divided by month. That's the units for the fractional adaptation. Um, one division sign month.
if you do not, if you cannot type this on your keyboard, you can also type it so. Um, Uh, you can also first type it in the equation. So one, and then you can use the division sign here from the keypad buttons. And then you type one, and then you copy it from here and you copy it there. If you do not find this division sign on the key um, board, you can find you can first uh, kind of write it in the equation area because that's where the keypad buttons work, and um, then you can um, copy it over to the units. But then, of course, you need to um, delete it from the equation so that the equations really just say zero point five. And I heard from Benson that they are still planning great improvements for. Um, the equations and uh, keypads. So watch out for other things that make our life a lot easier um, in the future. But this is already kind of working pretty neat. So Nikki, let's Nikki, we click have OK. A few questions in the chat about that fractional adaptation. I think some people are confused. I don't know if you can say it in another way or say it again, like mm -hmm. yeah. what that is and why it's 0.5. Yeah, 0.5 is my choice. Uh, it could be 0.25, like a quarter, or it could be a third, or or whatever. Um, so it means where I mean, let's take Juliet here. Juliet um, increases her love when she feels loved, right? So let's say um, Romeo loves her like by a number of 0.8, right? then Juliet will also change her love. But will she change her love by adding 0.8 as well, fully? No, it's rather like, I mean, it's only a fraction. So this represents like there's a delay in, in adapting. Uh, there's a delay in, in kind of how quickly she reacts. So she would just kind of in the first step, she would just adapt like 50%, right? And that's kind of this fraction. We might have another Juliet who adapt like just 10%, right? So the number that can be different on every person that we represent, and it's also something we can later play with. So the 50%, that was my choice. But it means that kind of she doesn't kind of fully integrate kind of or fully then um, also love him back with, with as much additional love as she perceived him having um, in the first kind of uh, month, it would just be kind of half of it. And, but then she would kind of further increase when she continues seeing him loving her. That's what, what, this, fraction, uh, what this fraction represents. And it's kind of, it represents how much kind of roughly how much there is a delay in Juliet's adaptation to Romeo and also in Romeo's adaptation to Juliet. So when the fraction is like very high, it's 0.9, for example, that's somebody who adapts very quickly to what they see and they add like love and very quickly or they decrease their love very, very quickly. Whereas if somebody kind of just um, adapts 10%, um, that means kind of they are much more kind of uh, stable and slowly reacting to what they perceive in the other person. And if we want to kind of, create these somewhat different people then and who are delayed in the reaction to the other, that's what we need. It's like the inverse of an adaptation time. So a, a fractional adaptation of a half or 50% means it's an adaptation time of two of two months. If it was a fractional adaptation was 0 0.25, it would be the in it's the inverse of four, like it's uh, it's a four, right? So that means kind of the adaptation time would be four months. Okay, so let's put the fractional adaptation time also for Juliet, zero point, uh, sorry, 0 0.5. The units we choose again, we choose one over month and we click okay. So again, 
Juliet is also 0 0.5, the fractional adaptation. The units are one divided by one. And we click OK. OK, now we need to define the change in Romeo's and in Juliet's law. So let's please start with Juliet. Uh, we click on Juliet and um, we see here that there are two variables that go into um, this rate of change. So on the one end, it is Romeo's love for Juliet and it's the fractional adaptation. So basically this equation would be Romeo's love. And when, so when we have the cursor here in the equation, we can click on Romeo's love for Juliet once. And this is multiplied by what fraction of this is actually gets adapted. So it's, it's multiplied with a multiplication sign. You can also use this from the, the keypad button and then you click on the fractional adaptation. So Romeo's love for Juliet times the fraction of how much of this Juliet adapts this month. And when Romeo's love is in love point and the fractional adaptation is in one over month and this is multiplied, then the units of the change in Juliet's love would be um, love point over month. So how many love point she changes per month? Divided by month. And make sure if you use love point before to use love point again and not love points. Okay, then we have the equation here for Juliet. So it's Romeo's love for Juliet multiplied with the fractional adaptation of Juliet's love in love point per month as unit. And that also means we are done with this equation here. And we can click OK. And we do the same with Romeo. And here we say, kind of, this is the runaway Romeo, right? So um, that means actually he changes in the opposite direction. So when he sees Juliet loving him, he runs away and he reduces his love. And when Juliet is more like very distant, then he increases his love. So he is inverse like to what he perceives her behavior to be. So that's why we put a minus sign here. You can also use it from the keypad. We put a minus there. And then again, the equation Juliet's love for Romeo multiplied with the fractional adaptation. So the difference is that we have this minus here um, for Romeo. And the units, again, we select them are love point per month. And then we can click OK. OK. And then a very, very, very important check, like as part of our model validation, is the units check. Because um, while it can sometimes be difficult to do the units like love point and one month and one over month, um, it really makes sure that kind of the, the model is logically built and we don't make a kind of um, logical mistakes. So please always use units and then we do a units check. And here on the left side, where you see my mouse, um, you see the units check button. Alternatively, you can also go to model and then click on units check. Model and then units check. Or you use in the new version, in the new layout, you use um, the uh, one that's on the left side that has like kind of this balance uh, there. And in my case, it says units are okay. That's what you want to see. That's not always what you get to see. And some of you might not see this. Um, so, uh, if you, uh, if you do not have the units, okay, there's also something coming up that actually tells you what the mistake is. It's not always easy to understand, particularly not when you see it for the very first time. 
um, I suggest go through it very, very carefully, or maybe you want to also post it to um, the, uh, the uh, questions, um, or to, um, because people can, um, we have people here who, who can answer it. Um, and check again um, whether you have actually defined all the all the units. I mean, sometimes it says like units are missing, right? Um, you might easily forget that. Or you, you one time you said, um, for example, uh, love point. The other time you said love points. Um, or you wanted to do like the slash for the division sign, but did something else. So check those things. Um, So hopefully units are okay. And this also means we are now ready for simulation. And before we do this, um, are there any major questions coming up? I think there was a lot of questions in, in the chat that have been answered, uh, Nikki. Okay. And I'm scrolling down here to see if there's anything else. There's one again, like where to check the units that's on the left, like the, the tool that says unit checks that looks like a scale, or you go to the very top line of your screen model. And then the third one, I think, I mean, at least in the new version is the third one, but it definitely, it says units, units check. Or control U, control key and U. You and like there's also, you. Sorry, there's, there's also a line of questions. I think people are still confused about the negative. So why you put a negative and change in Romeo's love, but also kind of going back to, you know, the, the negative link and how that links back. So there were many questions about that. Yeah, so that's kind of to, um, to model the runaway uh, Romeo, right? Kind of Juliet is a person, she loves Romeo even more the more he loves him. But we said, I mean, it's our choice. We could have modeled a different Romeo, but it was our choice to model Romeo in such a way that it's a runaway Romeo. So he finds Juliet so interesting when she's this, this woman in the distance uh, who doesn't just care so much about him. But when she gets too close, then he, he's, oh, no, 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 that, that's too much. Let, let me run away. And he, he starts to, to run. That's kind of he, when she loves him, like, he reduces his love, but when she's completely disinterested, he increases his love. So kind of he has this inverse relationship and that's what we modeled by the minus. Any, anything else? Um, no, that's it, um, Nikki. Uh, okay, wonderful. Okay. Um, do you think it would be worthwhile having five minutes for individual breakouts to answer further questions? Um, I think so. Can we maybe break okay. out in five? Yeah. Maybe, maybe we do. Let's do maybe the first one first. Let's do one more minute because that may also tell people where their kind of their models are running as they are supposed to be. So to run the model and then we will uh, give you the opportunity for five minutes to go into breakout rooms where there will be more people than just me to help you answer questions. So if you go to model at the top and because we still need to set up the simulation like how long should it be running and how should Ventsum calculate. So this is something we still need to do. Um, so if you go to model at the top row you click on it and then you click on settings. The default is that the model will run from zero to a hundred. Um, and also a little bit further down, it says the units of time are month. So that's fine. It, it simulates a hundred month. So let's change it to 60 months. So instead of a hundred, we type in 60 as the final time. Then we have the time step here. So what is the time step? The time step means how often does Vensem calculate per unit of time. So how often does Benson calculate per like simulated month? At the moment, this is one. This is rather imprecise. 
um, imagine if it was to calculate twice or four times or eight times, 16 times, this would be much more precise. And that's why we all select kind of just the smallest number here. So this is 128. So Benson would calculate 128 times per simulated month. It's a lot more precise. My recommendation is just by default, first always choose the smallest one for precision. It used to be an important question in the past when the computing power was very low, but you will see the simulate like just within a fraction of a second. So it's nothing we need to worry about too much. Later, if you have very large models, it might matter, but for initial ones, are my recommendations choose the smallest one. And I also here it has integration type. It has EULA. Um, that's how it integrates, how it calculates. My recommendation is generally just keep this. Um, for most models, it is okay. But today, let's choose Kunga that's another way to calculate. It is just a bit more precise even. So let's choose that one. And then you can click OK. So here it simulates from time zero to time 60. Time step, we just cho chose like the smallest one. We keep the units month. And also we keep, uh, we, we, uh, and then we, uh, we change the integration type to Runge Kutta. So that's kind of the, how the mathematics of integration um, and calculation, how that is done by Vensim, and you have um, two choices. So Eula is, is a bit more quick, and the Kutta is even a bit more precise. And we click OK. And then we can, the run name is here, it's current, let's call it base run. And then I clicked here on the green arrow. That's the run sign. And kind of you saw like in an instant it was running. So it's less than a second. So what is happening, right? So we saw kind of it would be the waxing and waning of love. So let's look at Romeo's love. Is it waxing and waning? We already have run it. So again, if you haven't done it, like it's this green triangle to run. And if you think nothing happened, it probably ran already. Um, so Romeo's love for Juliet, we click on it once. And then on the left, we have this graph error. That's the one with the, with the red zigzag um, drawing there. So here the graph tool on the left. So we click once into Romeo and then we click on the graph tool. And hey, there is Romeo's love, waxing and waning of Romeo's love, going up and down, maybe not a too happy Romeo after all. And then we click into Juliet's love. We do the same here on the left on the graph tool. Same, up and down of Juliet's love. Not the happiest person. And if we then click on Romeo, we click the shift key where you, that you use for making a capital letter and then we click into Romeo, then we have selected both and then we click on the graph tool. Now we have them both and we can grab this to make it a little larger. So what are we seeing here? This is quite interesting. So they both start, they meet each other, they find each other interesting and they both start a, like a bit like in love. And Juliet is in blue. So Juliet notices that Romeo finds her interesting and she even, that increases her love even more. But Romeo notices this and it's already kind of getting too tight. So he starts running away and kind of he decreases his feelings more and more. 
up to the point where they get negative, right? So he doesn't quite like her that much anymore because she's like, yeah, so too, too much in love with him. And at the point where Juliet notices that he doesn't like her anymore, she also starts to reduce her love, right? up to the point where she doesn't love him anymore. She, she thinks like, oh, what the heck is he? But then when she gets so negative here, for Romeo, she really starts to become interesting again and he starts increasing his love. And when he gets out of the negative zone, like really being in love again, then also Juliet starts to increase her love again. So you can see they're always kind of hunting each other, never really getting each other. And that one is kind of, you see they have the same behavior and kind of Juliet kind of starts and Rome, uh, sorry, yeah, starts and Romeo, um, Oh, sorry, like Romeo starts and then Juliet lags behind a little bit. So she shows the same behavior that uh, he had um, a couple of, of months ago, right? So um, you see kind of they are reacting to each other in this delayed way, but never getting each other. And if you have this behavior, it looks like you have done wonderfully. Some of you might have um, oscillations that actually grow a little bit over time. If it's kind of just tiny, you might not have selected the Euler. You might have selected the Euler rather than the Runge Kutta integration. If you if this is growing quite a bit, so it's like the the cycles are like doubling in size, then you might have selected a too large time step. So if we go back to the model here and we click on settings. Right. Um, so if this is growing kind of just a tiny, tiny bit, you might have selected Eula and you should select from Kutta. So just select from Kutta, click OK and click simulate again. And when it asks you, should I overscribe that base one, click yes. If it's really growing in size, like doubling in size, kind of the oscillations, then you might have chosen the, the not have modified the time step. So choose the smallest one. Click OK, simulate again. OK, and I think now is a good time to break out into breakout groups um, just for five minutes. But yeah, I do see some comments, um, generally general questions about system dynamics and how it can be applied. Yeah. Um, can the fractional adoption rate change dynamically? Yes. Yes. And more detailed and more elaborate models. It can also be dependent on other things happening. Yes, of course. Maybe Juliet is uh, listening to her friends and they tell her um, um, that she should react more. So she shouldn't react so much. Yeah, this can all change. So that's a bit right. And can, can it also be zero, um, Nikki? It can also be zero. Mm. Yes. Think maybe of that as a policy suggestion. And what does it mean? <laughs> so bring that up as a policy suggestion. I don't know if you're still searching. I see two hands up. So I think the first, uh, if you have more, like maybe we can do that later, but let's maybe then move to Awal Atata's question. Awal, you can unmute yourself and ask the question that you have. Oh, wow. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Um, I'm nice presentation, actually. Um, I'm more of a qualitative researcher, and um, I'm a PhD candidate with the American University of Nigeria. And I see most of the things that actually have been done is actually called quantitative in nature, and um, there are variables that we deal with in uh, in our own information system domain. Uh, where 
uh, our, var um, our uh, variables uh, do not really have quantitative uh, um, uh, um, measurement, sort of, so to say. So like, I'm just trying to find out if um, ensign or system dynamics can actually be used in carrying out qualitative uh, data analysis, just like it has been done in quantitative. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Oh, well, yeah, it, it can. And I think that one of the features I like so much about the method, it, it is, I mean, you can either map as we did it with this causal diagram that you have a word and error diagram without equations, um, just in a qualitative way. Uh, but you can even quantitatively model very qualitative concepts like love, for example. We just did it, right? And not many methods do this. So you can combine the, the like the softer and the harder and more physical variables. Um, of course, the quantification of those variables, the soft ones, the qualitative ones, is not always easy. And you might often work with an index, okay, between zero and one, and zero means, you know, this is very low, 0.5, and okay, this is rather medium, and one means, you know, this is very high. Uh, but then uh, you, you can also use it for qualitative. I've used it for like, attention, like attention, stakeholder attention, how high is attention, how high is inertia? So these things can be. Uh, next question, I, I saw that came from Montserrat Coppolon. Yes, hello, and thank you very much for uh, the seminar. Um, the thing I was wondering is when we were specifying the equations, we had to specify the sign. So uh, we had to manually write the minus for uh, the minus equation. And I was thinking or wondering, is there no way for Vensim to recognize that we had already specified the sign in, in the arrow? So that uh, it kind yes. of auto fields. Yeah. Um, so Vensim recognizes kind of in the stock that the rate of change is already connected by the other things you need to define yourself um, because kind of this plus or minus we do next to the error that's just kind of a visual add-on and we are not required to do this right that's why rec uh, that, that's why Benson doesn't recognize this immediately also it wouldn't know in the equation where you want to put the minus right so and how you want to put like you could have an equation that combines like five or eight different inputs so where does the minus go uh, and how do you put these things together that's why in those cases Benson couldn't know that right so if we forget the minus uh, even though we have a minus in the arrow it won't mark an error in the end in our equation right right okay. you could have a minus in the picture and a plus in the equation and Benson would not tell you about the error yeah okay Thank but, you. Yeah. It's because, I mean, uh, it's just a different uh, thing. So this is something it would be very difficult to detect for a computer. <laughs> right, right. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, Thomas um, Hyonidis. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. Uh, I have a question regarding the software package that I'm using. Uh, maybe you're familiar with Silico. No. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a web-based tool and it basically shows not a balanced system, but a system that goes out of uh, out of balance very rapidly. I can quickly share my screen, I think. Yeah, uh, Thomas, I'm afraid we might not have the time for that because we actually- Okay, that, then I'll just phrase it in a, and I'll just ask the question without sharing. Uh, so it, it goes out of balance very rapidly. Is that always related to the integral method that is behind the uh, modeling? It could be the precision, yes. It could be the precision, um, and and if we, if you have an oscillating system, um, then using more precision is very useful. That's why we switch from the Euler to the Rumekuta, and also why we use that very very small time step. Otherwise, they are growing. So your web-based tool, for example, might and not be as precise in calculating why it might be wonderful for other types of models but this one explicitly i mean it's then not um, as suitable yeah okay thanks um fernando are you here should we get people back or like yeah i'll close our rooms then yeah does it take a minute it does mm -hmm. Okay, so in that minute, there's another question by um, John Ayagatsori.
John, do you still have a question? You were going to take his question, Nikki? Yeah. Hello. Yes, I do have a question. Hello. What's your, yes, what's your question, John? Okay. Um, I remember uh, when um, I used um, causal loop diagram for my um, master's studies. Um, but right now, um, I want to also use um, systems, you know, dynamics for my PhD studies. But I got stuck because I was told um, I wouldn't be able to use um, um, just um, causal loop diagram for to get a PhD degree. So I need to further to quantify in it. So my question is, how do I, um, you know, quantify a qualitative data um, with um, this um, benzene? Because I see that I try to do that, but most times I get errors. So that's my yeah. question. <laughs> well, that's that's a very difficult question, um, John. I, I'm I'm afraid I, I don't think I can kind of just answer that um, directly uh, because it depends on what your uh, PhD advisors are requiring. I, I would say depending on what you are trying to achieve with the PhD, a qualitative model could be enough if you do a lot around it, right? So, I mean, there are like methods of how to develop a causal loop diagram and rigorously base it in data. And otherwise for improving the model, I would say um, kind of as just practical next steps, there is Lens seminar in October that Rebecca mentioned. There's also a, a, like an entire course, I think, at WPI, maybe um, uh, Rebecca and others can put also a link to that. Um, there okay. is the summer school at the next System Dynamics Conference. And there's at the System Dynamics website, there is a website with a, a page with all online System Dynamics teaching. Mm. So for those who need help with modeling, that's a good starting point. Um, Okay. Yeah. Okay. I Thank think um, it, it looks like everybody is back here. Um, this was Fernando's questions about is your model running? 91% said yes. So wait, you did a wonderful job. Uh, let's now move into um, the next one, kind of into our policy analyses. So what would you suggest? So at the moment we have these ups and downs in the relationship, but we want to have something stable or we want to have growing love. So which very, very, very simple changes are you actually recommending to improve this behavior? And like in model terms, like, um, change this variable, like increase that. That's what I mean. I'm not meaning kind of big real life stories. I'm, uh, um, yes, reduce the rate of change and, and vote on other what other people are, are saying, kind of reduce the rate of change. That's one, uh, <laughs> that's one thing. Um, decrease the rate, the fractional adaptation rate. Curious how one might remove the minus sign for Romeo. Yes, reduce the mi remove In the real minus life. sign for Romeo. Yes, um, change the initial values. Change on oh, yeah, remove the minus sign. There's also like change the direction of Romeo's love. Yes. Um, what is the objective function? Are we trying to make them counter cyclical? We are trying to make them happy. So we want, <laughs> ideally, we want increasing love, ever increasing love. Ever increasing, okay. Yes. Um, do you want me to read a few ones, uh, Nikki? I, I see them. I, I see them. Thank you, Fernando. Yes. Yeah. That's great. I think we have weight things to start with. So there's like reduced rate of change or like, um, and or give them a cell phone that's like increase the rate of change, right? Uh, so let's start those things. Um, and just to remember the other things was to have like to remove the minus of Romeo and um, to change the initial values. Yes, so. Um, um, Nikki, sorry to interrupt you. We were supposed to finish in two minutes, but uh, maybe you wanna tell what's gonna happen now if pe people want to continue here to watch what you're gonna say. 
um, or if you can, yeah, yeah. <laughs> got it. So I, I hope you are happy to just continue for a little bit. I mean, we will do the policy analysis, and it doesn't it doesn't take that much longer. So I would say, kind of, let's give us like maybe 15 minutes and then I, I would also be happy to stay longer for the questions that you might have. Yeah. So everybody who wants to stay, you're very, very welcome to stay. Good, and then um, I'm gonna share my screen. Going back to the model. Okay, so here we have the model and you said you want to reduce the rate of change. Um, so that means kind of how do you do this? I mean, the rate of change kind of the speed depends on this fractional adaptation, right? So we call this reducing change or like let's call it slower change. And we do this by these fractional adaptations. So if this is slower, I mean, they don't like adapt 50% to the others love. So let's just make them adapt like 10%. So um, this, oh, so now I'm going to click, sorry. I click on F of X um, equation tool. I click on the fractional adaptation and I change the 0 0.5 to 0 0.1. And I do the same for Juliet. 0.5 to 0 0.1. Always before you simulate, think about what you are expecting to happen. Right? Some of you expect maybe a happy relationship. I'm not so sure whether it is too happy. So let's see. We click into, oh, first we need to simulate. Oh, we need to simulate the green triangle. Then we click into Romeo, we click the shift key, we click into Juliet. When we click on the graph, what happens? They still oscillate, they just do it much more slowly. So I'm sorry. <laughs> it was your favorite option, but it didn't make them too happy. It, it just gave them longer phases of happiness, but also longer phases of despair. <laughs> they last longer. The next one was give them cell phones, right? That means they they adapt more quickly. So this is faster change. And in brackets, we put, give them cell phones. So we click on the F of X, the fractional adaptation, and we make this 0 0.9 for Romeo and 0 0.9 for Juliet. Some of you think, I think that was the second uh, most voted for option. So does it create happiness? Um, let's see. No, it's still oscillating. And now you see like a lot of graphs here. Um, so if we just click on one of them, we'll just look at Romeo, for example, you see that um, the base one, that's the green one, the slower change kind of that still oscillates. And now the faster change give them cell phones. They still oscillate in the same way, just faster, right? Just faster. So this means by changing how quickly they react, it does not change this oscillatory pattern. So we need to look somewhere else. There was one um, kind of popular both was, was change the initial values. Um, let's say, higher initial values. And for, 
for this, I put the fractional adaptation, I put that back to 0 0.5 so that we have a comparison. Fractional adaptation, I put back to 0 0.5 as it was originally. And then the initial Romeo's love, I put to zero. Let's put it to one. And initial Juliet's love, we put it to one. And we simulate. And what did we create here? So like the higher initial values, this means here you see they still, they still, oscillates so Juliet's love for Romeo, she still oscillates. But the ups and downs kind of they are higher, right? So but, but it's still oscillation. And also when we move down like Romeo's love for Juliet, higher initial values. Yes, it's the same pattern, just kind of with higher ups and downs. Not happier, I'm afraid, guys, not happier. There was somebody who asked earlier, like with when I explained the fractional adaptation of Romeo's uh, love. So, um, I mean, when I explained what it means and uh, who then asked, well, can we also set it to, uh, can we also set it to zero? So that is actually an option. So you know, when we change the fractional adaptation of Romeo's love, we can go so far in setting it to zero. And what does that actually mean? Um, so when we set the fractional adaptation of Romeo to zero here, zero, we put the initial values back to 0 0.5. Oops, initial Juliet to 0 0.5. What did we do? Um, basically, by not just kind of um, changing the fractional adaptation by a little bit, by making it fast and slower, we are setting it to zero. That means kind of since we multiply the in the change rate, we multiply the fractional adaptation with Juliet's love. And here we multiplied with zero. That means this link doesn't have any effect anymore. So basically this means we cut that link by multiplying Juliet's love with zero. It doesn't have an influence. So we get rid of this link, basically. So we cut the feedback loop here by setting this to zero. And what does this do? No adaptation Romeo. Let's look at Romeo's love. No adaptation Romeo. Romeo just stays where he is. He starts at 0.5, half in love, relatively happy, and he stays there. What does it mean for Juliet? Any idea? So that's always think through, like, what does she do when Romeo loves her a bit? She likes that, right? She loves him back. And so we have a wonderful old Juliet. Yep. Actually. So um, let's just see. Oh, I put this to zero as well, but that was supposed to be 0 0.5. So we keep Juliet as she is. So we, we just put kind of, we cut this link, but that one we don't cut kind of. Juliet still reacts to Romeo like 50%. And then Romeo stays where he is and Juliet, 
Juliet, Juliet, she increases her love because she feels loved and kind of she increases her love more and more and more and more. So that's already a pretty happy situation, right? Kind of Romeo stays rather constant, but positive. And Juliet just kind of loves him more and more. And they are not related by a feedback relationship anymore. Um, kind of Juliet is dependent on Romeo, but uh, Romeo not anymore on Juliet. And then some of you also said you want to change Romeo, right? To change it from a runaway Romeo into the opposite. So let's do that as well. The fractional change we put back to 0.5. Oh, that's also, yeah, that should be 0 0.5, wonderful. And then the change in Romeo's love, we take the minus away and we make it a plus. And this also means, and we right click here, we change this to a plus, but this is kind of just visual, so, um, it doesn't kind of, it's independent of the equation. So you have a plus here. And now from this balancing loop, we created a reinforcing feedback loop, right? Um, kind of they both react to each other in the same way. What are you expecting to happen? I would say you have done it. Um, you have created a very happy relationship. So let's look for Romeo and Juliet's love. Look at the graph. And you see here, we have an exponential growth of their love. Wonderful. <laughs> so you did a great job here. Great suggestion. And let's go through them again. So the first one was changing a parameter. And actually by doing this, you changed the speed in this feedback loop, you change the like how quickly the, the how how strong the delay is here, and by this you change the um, the strength of the feedback loop by making it stronger or making it weaker by changing a kind of these fractional adaptations, and up to the point where when you set it to zero, then actually you cut a link. So changing the parameters and then changing um, the strength of feedback loops is something you can do in policy analysis. Um, then you can uh, completely cut links. You can improve the model by cutting links that are not very useful. You can inverse the polarities. Um, and you cannot only cut links, but of course you could also add structure. So I guess there were a couple of suggestions that came about, about and also when we think about your initial variables, there was a lot about kind of their family, et cetera. You could also link structure to this. So these are the things how you can do policy analysis in a model. And um, so this was a small example where we started this. And I'm just going back to a couple of slides um, where we summarize this again. So now you see the slides again, kind of we started with our problem definition, we drew key variables behavior over time of feedback diagrams. We did the stock and flow diagram equations and simulation and now also the policy analysis. We have not focused that much on model validation, right? Kind of really checking that the structure that we built corresponds to the original, uh, for example. Um, that was not the purpose of today, but you could imagine that somebody goes through the play of, of Shakespeare and goes through the text and really writes down like variables by going through the text, then builds a model, etc. And so this is all uh, possible. And we went through the process today. Of course, um, it is never that linear, right? It has ups and downs. So this is a picture from Jürgen Randers where he sh showed that already in the conceptualization phase, you go up and down and you go towards sketching something by doing this, you understand the problem better. So you ask a different question or you ask it slightly differently. And then you start uh, quantifying, you model like a part of the, the, the simulator part of the model, you notice your, it doesn't really fit. It doesn't produce the right behavior. So you start thinking, so what's wrong about my thinking? Is the structure different? You go deeper and deeper. So it's this process really learning about, um, about your problem more and more and more. And 
Um, just a few thoughts on bridge system dynamics modeling. Bridge system dynamics modeling does take into, and let, let's not say this is about quantitative modeling. Of course, there is kind of qualitative modeling as well. There's group model building, all these other things. In quantitative modeling, it's good to focus on what are the accumulations. They can be physical things like our swimming pool, but our social and mental accumulations like love, uh, what are they? Then focus on delays. There was a delay in their adaptation to each other that was important. And there can be material delays that it takes time to transport something, or there can be like here, uh, delays in the noticing. Um, and um, then also something that we did not cover today, those are nonlinearities and nonlinear effects when one and another variable are um, related, not in a linear way that kind of it increases to a proportion, but if the proportion actually changes. Um, and then uh, feedback is important, kind of what are the balancing and the reinforcing feedback loops. And you see it made such a difference in behavior. Our balancing feedback loop created a completely different pattern with the oscillations than the reinforcing feedback loop that had exponential growth of love and um, perpetual happiness of Romeo and Juliet. So those are the elements of structure that are important. And then there are also elements of decisions and actions and representing them. So it's very important to represent perceptions because people make decisions not on the system as such, but on the perceptions that they have on the system, right? Romeo um, adapted his love to what he perceived Juliet's love to be. And by the time he adapted, kind of Juliet had already changed her love as well. So they were already kind of perceiving a, rather the past than the real situation. And also model information uh, and a model kind of decision making based on the information that people really have. So don't make them like, um, oh, know everything if in the real world they um, know everything. So also in the model, people's decision making should depend on the things that, uh, that are also just uh, available as information to them in the real world. So where we talked about policies today, you saw, you know, if you can tweak something like tweaking the constants that was kind of making Juliet uh, less reactive and Romeo or, or like giving them cell phones to interact more quickly. I like would tweak the constants. And um, a lot of actually a lot of studies are focusing on this. And it can sometimes be very useful because you want to know what a good parameter value is. Um, but it's often good to think more deeply what does it actually do. So it typically strengthens and weakens feedback loop, like our balancing uh, feedback loop that was strengthened or weakened by that. Other things to think about in policies are uh, to cut feedback loops, like some of you um, suggested. Um, and uh, if it's the detrimental feedback loop, take away a link and think what does that actually mean in the real situation uh, by taking away information or taking away um, something else. Of course, you can add feedback loops um, and you can add entire elements of structure larger than a feedback loop and you can add like new feedback loops or integrate them into structure. Plus, always when you do this, think about also uh, addressing delays in the feedback loops, for example. Good. And also when you design policies, think about where they fit into the system, kind of whether it's kind of just this changing of the numbers and the constants or whether it's an entire change of the feedback structure or of the delays in the system or going even deeper where you change uh, the goals uh, and the rules of the system kind of what people are striving for or even more deep to change the paradigms and way of thinking that um, determine our goals and then the feedback structure information structure etc and this we can read more about this in Data Meadows work that is linked here. And if you want to read further, you can uh, read about Romeo and model, uh, Juliet as a teaching case in Moorcroft and Radwicki's work. Also, if you get really interested, um, there's work by Sergio Rinaldi. And uh, if you're interested in the system dynamics process, um, I think the picture and chapter by Renders gives a good overview. 
And there's a very nice article by Nacho Martinez Moyano and George Richardson that compares different um, people's con like uh, system dynamics modeling processes. Like everybody kind of um, makes it a little bit different, but I think that's a very nice uh, read to give you an understanding. Of course, Sturm and Business Dynamics is always a good read that also gives you information on this. Um, two videos I would recommend on system dynamics principles by Dana Meadows and George Richardson. And if you want to know more about how do we actually get to the model, like do we know what to put in and what to not to put in, especially from text data, there's a paper by Hyung Jung Kim and also by Sibel Ika and myself. And those of you who are interested in learning more about system dynamics, um, kind of there's Lens um, presentation, there is kind of a WPI course. And what I like very much is um, the Diaries During and After Lockdown uh, project that put self-paced system dynamics learning materials online. It is about um, the example of COVID, uh, but at the same time, it's an introductory system dynamics modeling course. So if you're interested, check that out. And yeah, thank you very much um, for listening and uh, for modeling and for joining. It's great that so many of you finished um, actually with a simulation model and that it was running. Um, and I'm happy to answer more questions. Thank you so much, Nikki. This was fantastic. We've got a, a lot of very positive comments in the chat, a lot of people who have been turned on to system dynamics. And we're looking forward um, to seeing you all in the future. We are going to have similar sessions like this from different vendors. So watch for those as well as um, considering the system dynamics fundamentals course that is available asynchronously from WPI. It's a, a very good foundational course that will take you through a lot of the questions that you had for Nikki here. Um, and it's, uh, it's always important to um, hear it over and over again and hear it described in different ways. So would highly encourage that as well as other things within our online course catalog. Um, I guess, thank you. Uh, Fernando, would you like to say Rebecca, anything more? Rebecca, yep. Rebecca can I, if it's not too rude, just, I didn't understand if Romeo's love stays constant, why did Julia's love increase? Why didn't it stay constant too? Is it because every, every month another chunk is added and Julia thinks that he loves her more, but it's the same amount? Yes, yeah, so in that one run where we had put kind of Romeo's change zero, Juliet's change was not zero. So by putting Romeo's change to zero, he stayed with his love at 0.5. So he was like a bit in love. But Ro Juliet still reacted to that. So every time kind of she increased, like every month when she notices, okay, maybe um, Juliet, uh, Romeo gave her like a flower every month. So she noticed this and she ever like, it wasn't a big gesture, but every small gesture means kind of she reciprocated more. So that's why her love continued to increase. Yes, thank you. Um, Miki, before you move on to other questions, I just wanna finalize some um, news from you guys. So the upcoming webinar here is on uh, September 1st, housing dynamics. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of system dynamics and also systems thinking and mapping. So it's a great opportunity to learn uh, from both perspectives. And I, Rebecca just mentioned this uh, course, the system dynamics fundamentals for the WPI, which you also mentioned. You can find it under the learning menu on online course catalog. There's a discount for society members. So if you're not a member yet, you can join and get a discount for this one. And if you don't, you're not a member, but if you sign up via our website, you get, um, I think, $10 discount. And I think you're, you got already an email with a link to give feedback. It's really important for us uh, so we can improve. So I really hope that you can uh, have, have three minutes just to answer this uh, survey I sent out. Thank you so, so much. This was such a pleasure uh, for me to, to have you guys here. Um, Nikki, if you have time to answer a few questions, I think people are eager to ask yeah. them. <laughs> I'm happy to stay on and answer questions. And sorry that I kept people for so long. <laughs> what are the limitations of the evaluation copy that we, we downloaded? Is it 60 days or is it, you can't print? Actually, it's, it's a, 
prominent, uh, and maybe like also people from Mentana Systems want to come in there. Um, it's a prominent uh, a copy actually that can be used privately. So you cannot use it for, like, if you want to do business uh, with it, then you would need to pay for it. But privately it, it's prominent. And uh, so you, you see, you can build simple models with it. So it's quite capable. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's right. And even for commercial use, it's cheap. I see that Evans uh, Mwamba has a question. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I just wanted to ask if this video has been recorded, how possible that the participant can be shared so that we can appreciate the proceedings because you know sometimes we could have we could have missed one or two things. I hope my question is clear. Uh, yes, um, so this was recorded and it will be distributed, but I think Rebecca said it would take about 24 hours for um, the video to be created. Thank you so much. I also see a question by Rahul. Uh, yes, uh, it, it was a great presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Nikki. And I also wanted to ask uh, that uh, this model which you uh, showed was uh, more of a conceptual model. So I wanted to ask uh, how can, uh, you know, uh, we can create models based on real world data and uh, how, I mean, what, what can be the overall procedure to go about doing that using system dynamics? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I mean, you, you can use as a, I mean, what to include in a model and what not to include is, is always like a difficult uh, question, maybe some of the <laughs> most important ones. So, um, I mean, you, you can use existing literature, for example, to find out what important variables are, or you can um, ask a, a group, maybe some experts or a combination of experts and lay people affected people so what are what are really the important variables kind of that's a good starting point and always start kind of what's the problem like what's the like the one two or three variables over time that define the problem and then start with the smallest smallest model you can think to represent that don't make it complete right don't model Romeo and Juliet's love in all the, its entirety really start with the core with as small a thing we started with today and then you might have other wishful things and variables that you want to add. Uh, but I would recommend that as a starting strategy to go and to decide whether you include a variable or not. Always ask yourself, what's the problem I want to model? Is it really, really important to the problem or not? It might be an important part of the system in general, but if it's not very important for the problem, then you can rather exclude it or put it like to the maybe list. That's like a, a short answer to actually a very, very good and complex question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Excuse me, how do you find the sample models that come with the version that we get for free, the PLE? I can't find them. I know it's me, but if you just give me a second, I don't know how to find them. They're in the uh, uh, help system. Yeah, I okay. show that again. I let me let me show I, that I'm very trying quickly. To I I've been I, I'm trying to find the help system and, and and this shows my limitations, but if you just give me one minute and show me where they are. Yeah. So them. I'm are you running my... Windows or Mac? Windows, sir. Okay, if if you go to your C drive, um yes, sir? on your C drive, there's a users folder. Yeah, um, go, go in there. And my name. Uh, yep. Not your name. No, you want the public Sorry. folder. Okay, let's, I apologize. One second. Um, let's see. Users. The then public. public. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. Then, then Vensim. Oh, there's Vensim. We're getting it. There's the models. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also sharing my screen again. So if you are in Vensim, and if you click on help at the top here, and on Vensim manual, that's something I should have um, shown to you earlier. Uh, you have all like kinds of help here. And what's particularly used, I mean, 
of course, there are the models that come with Benson, so you can look at existing models. But also here, there is a user guide. That's basically an introduction to system dynamics modeling and Vensim. And also there's the modeling guide for more specific questions. And further down, there's a reference guide for specific uh, you're, elements. You're not, of you're not showing the manual if you thought you were. Ah, OK. Maybe it's still showing, showing the model. OK. Then just at the top, click on help, click Music. on Vensim manuals and then click on start with the user guide then Hello. once you have worked through that you <laughs> take the modeling guide and yeah thank you that was nice thank you thank you thank you so much thank you very much this was an excellent uh seminar that's great unbelievable. You like it. Yeah, you did it. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, thank you. It was a, a great session. Uh, I want to know about uh, other run uh, run tools. Uh, the green arrow, the red arrow, and uh, run reality checks. Ah, uh, so you want to know about kind of all the other buttons that you find in Vensim? Yeah. Yeah, so um, at the, I mean, so the top has three rows, right? Um, so the third one, kind of where we have like this variable button, the rate button, the arrow button, kind of that also has further buttons. For example, if you want to use an existing variable again, etc., um, it also has an what's called an input out IO object tool. That's another interesting one. Um, that's the one with the graph inside there. You can actually kind of, we always had the graphs that were popping up. You can make them part of the picture. You can also next to it, there's a comment. If you want to write something that is not just like a, a not a variable, but just a comment, you can use this. So kind of they all help you in model building. And then on the one that go down on the left, they are the ones kind of that help you in model analysis. So we use the graph tool, um, but you can also show the results not as like a, a figure, but all the numbers in a table, for example. Um, that's the table tool. Um, or you click on loops. So if you click on a variable and then on loops, it shows you all the loops that the variable is part of, or at the top, like the causes tree and the users tree. So what are the causes of all these, of, of a variable? What all the things that go into it or all the things that go out of it? So there are lo lots of other, um, other um, uh, uh, things. So kind of the one at the top, they help you build the model. The one on the left, they help you um, uh, analyze and look at the model. And then the one at the bottom, there's a line as well. That's often kind of to, um, to uh, for example, change the font size, etc. On the top right, a reality check and uh, a slider chain. Yeah. The red arrow. I'd, I'd be happy to answer that. Yeah, um, if you go ahead, yes. Vensim can run simulations in a lot of different ways. And the way Nikki has shown you today is to just use the standard simulation run. Um, the button beside it with the little tails coming out of it, um, that's SynthiSim mode. That's where you can kind of change things on the fly. Um, if you've got your model and it's running, press it and you'll see how that works. And yeah. the other things, are, you, you can do sensitivity, optimization, and reality, reality checks. And um, the best thing to do is have a look in the help system for those. Um, not all of them are in events in PLE, but the help system has got details on every single simulation mode we have available. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, the, the red one that I that you you meant uh, uh, that's the one kind of if you click on this, the constants will become sliders, and you can just move them, and then the model makes that change right away. Okay, thank you. 
have a nice day. Thank you. And Fernando, do we have any more questions um, from anywhere that came up or? Um, let me see. Well, if you have time, I've got one more question. Last question, probably. Can you hear yes, me? Go ahead. All right. Thank you so much, Nikki, and thank you for everyone involved. Uh, my question is that when we talk about complex systems, we have, we have variables that some sort of they have uh, um, emergent properties. Can we introduce those variables, those properties in dynamic systems? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's not that, that's not like a like a beginner's uh, a question. You can have, I mean, there are different ways to represent this. So one, uh, for example, is if the constants actually become dynamic variables themselves. So in that sense, kind of they, they change over time, and and so you just add model structure. That is one way to you might be able to represent this. Another way to represent this is, for example, when you have, um, maybe this is rather than in VENTT, rather than in VENSIM, where, you, where variables can rather have different properties in the sense of having a race um, where you can represent this as well. I don't know whether somebody from Ventana system also wants to say a bit more about that. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. I mean, there are there are different senses or levels of emergence. Uh, surprising behavior can emerge from a system that you could build in PLE where the sort of the behavior of the whole is distinct from the behavior of the parts. But often what is really meant by that is the kind of emergence you get in a multi-scale system where you have a bunch of ants on a pile of sugar and complex behaviors emerge at the macro level that you didn't expect from the individual behavior of the ants. And that's a case uh, where you might want to use Ventity or NetLogo or some other tool that's more adaptive to that kind of uh, situation. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you again for everybody who brought the seminar today. Thank you. Nikki, can I add something? What do you say about agent-based model modeling versus system dynamic modeling? Because you just brought it up with the ants, the individual behavior giving a, an emergence. So what is your take on that? Uh, so, uh, I mean- Go ahead. You first. <laughs> yeah, I think that they are both very good for what they want to do, right? So kind of, um, there are some problems where you really want to represent all the agents and there are other problems where it's, I mean, it's, you have a strategic perspective, an aggregated perspective, which is more to system dynamics. And then, I mean, it's easier and easier to just combine them both. So one of the students uh, here, um, she did an agent-based modeling to model like the meters in a, a library archive. Like, so every meter was an agent that aged, so paper was aging and she had kilometers of paper. And then she built a system dynamics model around it, like to handle um, the museum, like with kind of the decision making, et cetera, that is, is happening. So I think both um, have great value and depends on your question that you are answering, which one you're using or which combination of both you use. And I don't know, Tom, whether you want to add. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Uh, we do lots of hybrids as well. So, uh, you know, for example, we just built a city energy model that has an aggregate city and an aggregate electric power utility. It has cohorts of vehicles, so kind of an array conceptualization of that. And then it has 10,000 individual buildings with distinct decision making. And there are, there are lots of trade-offs, you know, so the reason we we went with 10,000 individual building agents was that we didn't know how to aggregate buildings uh, for all the decision-making around heating and cooling systems. Um, but then on the other hand, your model becomes big and slow and data hungry. And, you know, it's basically expensive and you have a whole bunch of 
new behaviors of the buildings that you have to specify that you might be able to kind of gloss over in an aggregate conceptualization. And, you know, some of those lead to insight, but a lot of them just lead to extra work or arbitrary decisions that you have no way to validate. Um, so, uh, you know, basically, I would always aspire to start aggregate and then switch to an agent perspective when I realize that there are phenomena implicit in the aggregation that that I can't easily represent that way. And then uh, then I would transition to agents in order to understand what's going on there. But that's not always the case. Can I ask one other thing? It's, forgive me, I'm overdoing this. I, I, I don't want to hear myself talk, but I, it's my question. Prey predator, you can net logo it, you can system dynamic it next, you know what I'm trying to say, and you can also use differential equations per mass. So what's your take on that? They're all the same. Uh, and, you know, if you do it in NetLogo, you could easily make it spatial, but you could easily do that in Vinity as well. But uh, otherwise, you know, system dynamics is fundamentally a system of ordinary differential equations. So the Latka Volterra model in Greek letters that you'll find on Wikipedia is exactly the same as. Uh, as the one you'll find on my in my model library in Vensim. Yeah, but, but forgive me, and you guys just shut. Um, you can shut Jay, me off. But, Jay, when you take... Maybe let's do the specialist question because I, I think we have a lot of like we have a large majority of people who are really like absolute beginners. Um. So let let's um. I'm not sure whether everybody can follow that. So let's maybe do those specialist questions privately. Um. I would like to ask Fernando um, whether there are any questions um, that are largely shared still by the audience that haven't been answered. Um, related to the model, Nikki, no. Um, but there is one question that I would like to maybe answer. It's about, uh, is there any free online digital database repository for system dynamics model previously developed so that we, one does not have to start from scratch building models. I want to say that the society is planning to have one on our website. Um, so who wrote this question? Novi, uh, if you maybe email us, uh, in, if you're willing to help us build this database, that would be great. Uh, if you're familiar with system dynamics, of course, and would like to help, uh, but it's in your plans to have such a database. Uh, and then scrolling down a little bit, can we have the slides? Uh, we're going to share the recording and the slides on the seminar series page. So it's systemdynamics.org slash seminar series. Um, and is there anything else uh, you want to answer here, um, Mickey? Mm. So one question is what is not available in Vents and PLE? So I think that it um vents in ple does not allow you to do sensitivity analysis a sensitivity analysis is if you change a parameter like let's say from like 20 to 80 percent and then you also see somewhere else the changes that this triggers in other variables in the model so this is a very typical analysis that you do when you like you do further steps in modeling um, so you kind of, if you really do a lot of system dynamics modeling, you want to use a quantitative model for your PhD, for example, kind of that's the point, I guess, where events in PLE does not do anymore what you need. But before that, um, yeah, you, you can really build models and um, do analysis and yeah, just start there. Yeah, there's well, a lot of dynamics to learn before you outgrow PLE. <laughs> Were you not doing sensitivity analysis when you were changing uh, the parameters on the Romeo and Juliet? I did them by hand. Yes, I did that by hand. Um, uh, but uh, Ransom also does that and gives you like a graph of like how many of your 200 or 1,000 runs that it did lie in what range, et cetera, in terms of outputs. Yeah, so, but yeah, in events in PLE, you do this by hand. So, but that's maybe the important learning, right? So you have a more closer feel to what you do and what the output is. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, Len, do you have a question or? I, I just want to make a comment. Someone asked about models. Mm -hmm. If you use this interesting tool called Google and you look for something called Systems Zoo, Systems Zoo by Hartmut Bosel, you should find approximately 100 models in Bensim that are out there somewhere in the cloud, so to speak. Um, I'll put the link in the chat. Thanks, Tom. And then, uh, of course, John Sturman's textbook has lots of them. Most textbooks have lots of models. And then finally, the SD bibliography, which was in the chat earlier, you can find many, many models from the society conferences. They're not all Vensim or Studio or Stella. It's a hit and miss. If you go to the conference proceedings and you find an interesting paper, look for uh, a little icon that says supporting. And if you click on supporting, you might be rewarded with a model. And I can also recommend, like if you know a good model, a small good model, rebuild it, right? Um, try to build it yourself. Try to think about what equation would I put in and then check like, did the author also look, um, choose that equation? So rebuilding other people's models is a really good training tool. You can use um, J. Forrester's models, market growth model, for example, or the world one model. Um, I think you've answered most of the question. Um, of course, there's a question we can maybe share with you and the Ventana team uh, to be answered later and we can share in our blog, uh, Nikki. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would say this was a great webinar. And uh, we already, I was picking at the feedback um, from people and most people thought it was excellent and I really hope to see everyone in the housing uh, dynamics webinar coming up in 1st of September. And we can definitely share more uh, resources. The website of the society is a great place to find resources to study system dynamics. And also for networking, meeting people in the field, joining a special interest group, joining a chapter in your country. Um, so you continue in this journey of learning um, there's also a page, the degree um, courses page, where you can find, if you're looking for a degree in system dynamics, you can find university in different countries uh, all over the globe uh, to study system dynamics. So yeah, stick around the, the system dynamics society, I think is the best way to, to learn more. And that's all for me, Nikki.